Hello. Hi. Hi, Kara. It's, it's already recording. So oh, I, I'm having some technical issues over here. So I'm going to close a few programs down and start again. And hopefully that will get us sorted. Hi. Okay. Hi, it is already recording. I don't know who started the recording. Oh, there we go. Unmute my speaker. There we go. We sorted. Hi. Hi. Yes, I can hear you and you can hear me. This is good. <laughs> yes, that's nice. I told you it was already recording. I do not know who started it, but it was okay. already on when I entered. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Um, Shall I, uh, let me just see what happens if I launch this again um, and make sure that I can still keep the audio going. Can you still hear me? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, and you can still see me, which is good. Because um, then it's just a little hack so that I can still see what I'm sharing screen-wise. Um, let me just share the screen and here we go hopefully yes. you can see your presentation yes okay good stuff um yeah it's working nice great uh yeah okay then i'm happy that is working <laughs> <laughs> Where should I to go? Oh, thank you so much for volunteering to help me. I really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, nice to do. Yeah. No, it's good because it's, I think there's like 100 people who have signed up oh, wow. on, the, nice. on the system. Oh, that's me. Let me just stop that. Um, yeah, I think we've got 100 people signed up. On the system um and so we'll see how many come because i think people have kind of bookmarked it as something to come back to sometimes rather than something that they want to attend um but we'll see yeah but the thought of managing 100 people on my own while also talking was just <laughs> terrifying so um so yeah no, i'm really grateful of course yeah yeah uh yes uh, yes Oh, uh, yeah, I go. Do you hear me as well? Uh, no, last year I wasn't here. This is my first time. At no, no, I, I asked. Oh, no, it's gone. I heard the echo. No, I, I was want, uh, starting to tell you that yesterday I also went to two workshops. Oh, good. Uh, and the interaction went really uh, nice with the chat. So, okay. It is not, not, not very. Uh, very, very chaotic. So. <laughs> That's reassuring. I know because you never really know what to expect um, yeah. with these things. But yeah, hopefully that will that will lend itself to a good session for us as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I think the rules are just make a start when when it's time. And uh, yes. Um, most of them wait a minute till uh, the message dropping in. Yeah, okay. Done. And yeah. Great. I, I guess uh, most of the people are on mute when they enter. I think you can set the settings, not sure. Okay. Yes, looks like I can. So I think that will be useful to set them on mute. Yeah. Do you, do you know how to manage that side of things? Um, I do not have the authority here, but there, in the bottom there should be, uh, sometimes you can see stuff where you can uh, handle things like this, but yeah. I'm not seeing it. So I guess I do not have the authorities in this Zoom. Yeah, um, let me see. It says I can, 
I can claim host. Yes, you are. I think you are host, but do you have Am to host, host okay. codes? Do you have host codes? So should so I claim you, host? Who am I claiming it from? <laughs> yeah, it, it just means you get the extra authorities to to set uh, to okay. place people on mute or but maybe the organization did that already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but this Javier, who's already in the meet, is actually an organizer. I don't know. He was already in it when I. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's good. And do you do you have the option to claim host? Can you see that no. as well? No, you don't. Okay. And I can't make you host. Yeah, because otherwise that would be the easy way to do it. <laughs> no. And keep me right on how you say your first name. I grew up in France. So to me, it looks like Martin, but how do you say it? Oh, and it's not too bad, Martina. Martina, okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, we'll see. There's a lot of material in this workshop. Yeah, so. Um, how many forget. slides do you have? Yeah, yeah. Many slides. Hopefully, it won't be too overwhelming. I try to make sure that it's a. Uh, it's a step-by-step -step thing, you know, each bit builds on the bit beforehand. So if people get stuck, they can they can go back. Yeah. Uh, and do, do you have breaks? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah we're gonna take three 10 minute breaks. Um just so that people can people can work on their own plots and they can have a look at how it works and yes, nice. go get a coffee, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it's nice. I ran some of this material in a, a local uh, ladies group um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, I think actually being online and having the breaks online makes it less intense because people are free to go for a walk or come back and, you know, switch off <laughs> or get a coffee. Um, whereas if you're all in the same room, it makes that more difficult to, to do that well. Yeah, yeah. it is. It's different. And uh, one of the workshops, he was, uh, yesterday, uh, when it was a break, he stayed in the in the meet for questions. So people had questions, and of course he was answering them. So I I didn't uh, dare to leave because I would miss the answers to the questions. Yeah, we'll probably do a bit of that here as well. Um, and I'm going to say to folks that they can they can send me a plot if they want, um, and I'll try and give some feedback. Um, oh, nice. So we'll we'll see if I can make that work. Nice. Yeah. I just really enjoy those interactions. Like it's just it's such a nice thing to be it able is. to see. Um, and I feel like when you're if you're the only person in your organization that's working on visualization, that can be quite isolating. So it's really nice to be able to have these conversations with other people who are interested as well. Yes. It is. Are you one of the few people then in your company doing these? Well, things? I'm self-employed now. Um, oh, okay. so, yeah, so it's yeah. just me. Then you are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I am. Um, but in my previous job, it was a very small team. So it's nice to kind of meet people from teams in different different places and try and form connections there as well. Yeah. And how about you? Remind me where you work again. Uh, I work uh, at the University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands as an institutional okay. researcher. Mm -hmm. And Great. I work uh, yeah, all the time with R and very interested in making my plots more comprehensible to others. Yes. <laughs> well, hopefully this will have some good tips for you. Um, yeah. It's stuff that I use all the time. So I'm kind of sharing a bit of my the behind the scenes stuff. Um, that I use, so hopefully people will, will enjoy it. Very good. Now people start to... Yeah. Hello to everyone who's joining us. I'm just gonna pop in the chat um, a link to a page on my website that has got a link to the slides um, and a list of packages that might be useful. So people can take a quick look at that if they want to. Um, there 
Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, there you go. Geom Bath is such a nice package. Sorry? Geom Bath is such a nice package. It's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. I use it quite a lot. I, I used it in um was it one that I was doing for some academics that had a paper with um it was just some line, few, you know, three lines with the margins with the error bars on either side. Um and so in, instead of doing real error bars and real lines, I used John text pass so that the, the variable was actually written on the line, which made it easier. And then I used segments that so I could stagger them a little bit so that you could actually see which error bar belonged to which. You can see the error bars in full rather than them overlapping with each other. It's a nice little trick to, to have done yes. that. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Hello there. Hello. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you? Uh, this is, I'm actually on Carolyn's uh, Zoom. My name is Rachel. Um, I'm just going to rename myself here. Um, sorry about that. That's fine. Um, so I am going to go ahead and make you a presenter here. Okay. Um, Second. Okay. Um, okay. So you should have co host privileges now. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, the session is recording, obviously. Um, you'll be responsible for running the session. So kick it off whenever you're ready. Um, yep. And you can utilize the QA, um, which is what we would re recommend um, rather than the chat, just because it's easier to keep a track of. Um, you can okay. also run polls as well if you'd like to. Um, and you should be able to share your screen now. Yeah. And um, would you like me to just do that? Yeah, that'd be great. You yeah. already could share your screen. Yeah. Yes, I was sharing it earlier, so hopefully. Perfect. It still works. That yes. looks great. All right. Um, so, did you have any questions before the workshop? Um, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> I've never actually used the, the question and answer thing. I've only ever used the chat. So, is there anything I need to tell people about how to use that? Um, I don't think so. So, really, just directing people if they have questions um, to go in the Q and A. Uh, we would recommend that uh, you do read the questions out loud, just because we are recording this, and so anybody who watches the recording later on, um, mm -hmm. so just read the question. Um, you don't necessarily have to say who answered or submitted it, um, but you can yeah. if you'd like. Um, okay. Yeah, and then just um, it will go into open and then maybe at a break that you choose, you could go in and mark things as answered just to help you keep track of questions that come in. Okay, that's great. And um, I've actually got Martina here who's kindly volunteered to help me with the, the questions as well. Is it possible? Does she have access to that? And can she do a bit of the marking? Yes, let me. Uh, so Martina, I just put you as a co-host. Um, let me see know if you can see the Q&A and yes have I can see the Q&A I could already see that before okay great yeah. so let's see here okay so you, we should yeah it says only host and co-host can see the questions okay oh, great All right. So Q&A is on and we 
we should be all set. So unless you have any other questions, uh, you feel free to kick off whenever you'd like. If you want to wait just another minute or so, you're welcome to do that as well. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you very much. I think a few people are still joining us. We'll give them give them a few minutes. Um, at the the top of the chat, if people want to have a look at that, so I've put a link to my website where you can find these slides again um, and the list of packages that might be useful. Um, if you want to code along with us today. And as I said, we'll just give folks a few more minutes before we kick off. A few more people joining, I think, but we'll make a start um, in a few minutes. We seem to, have, I think, we've stabilised um, <laughs> near a third of the number that said that they were going to come. So let's make a start, and people can join us um, as and when they do. Um, so first off, thank you so much to everybody for for joining us this afternoon um, or this morning, wherever you are. It's an afternoon for me. Um, today we're going to be talking about leveling up our plots um, and little tips and tricks that we can use to make sure that this, the main story in our plots really comes across um, as intended to our audience. And um, let's uh, just share a wee slide um, as we get going um, as a, a word of introduction. So I'm Cara Thompson um, and I'm a data visualization consultant. Um, and I've ended up here um, through a love for patterns um, in music and in language. Um, and a fascination with how the human brain processes all of this. Um, and I was privileged to do a PhD in psychology, um, gosh, over 10 years ago now, um, and really enjoyed um, learning all of that process um, and seeing how the brain responds to unexpected things that it comes across in music and language. Um, from there, I went into the analysis of postgraduate medical exams and spent about decades doing that. And trying to um, get across to, to busy surgeons uh, what was going on in the exams in a way that they understood it quickly enough that it wasn't taking up um, too much time in the meeting, but that it was, it was clear enough that they knew what to act on. Um, and from then, I became a data visualization consultant, really focusing on that, that visual storytelling that we can do with our data, which I believe is a great shortcut in helping people grasp your story, but also helping people remember your story. And so we'll talk about ways that we can make it memorable as we go today. And um, there we go. And the thing that drives me in all of this is helping others maximize the impact of their expertise. The goal for today is to equip you with some design tips and coding tricks to make the most of color and text uh, when you're creating your visualizations. Hopefully that's what you've come here for. Um, if not, you might be in the wrong workshop, but I'm hoping that you're here and that even if you're in the wrong, wrong workshop, that you will stick with us and learn some really useful stuff. Um, we're going to explore how to be a bit less dependent on annotations by using colors really well. Um, we're going to illustrate ways in which we can use color and fonts to add some text hierarchy, which just helps all the important bits of text stand out and above the stuff that is less important. Um, we're going to apply all of the above to create some story enhancing annotations. And we'll pack, look, talk about packaging up reusable bits of R code, whether that's a, a color scheme 
um, or a theme for our plots that we can then reuse and avoid copy pasting them all over the place in our code base. I'm going to introduce you to ggtext and geomtextpath, which are two packages that I use a lot in uh, creating annotations for the plots. Um, and I'm hoping to give you some feedback on your own plots as well if you're, if you're game. Um, if you send me some stuff that you're working on, then I would be more than happy to, to chat about that as well. But housekeeping before we get started. Um, rule number one, please ask for help. Um, I've been trying over the last few while to teach myself JavaScript, just as a new thing to learn. And I've been reacquainted with how frustrating it is to get totally stuck on something that you know must be really basic, but you're stuck on it. And um, don't do that in this workshop. If you're feeling stuck, reach out um, in the, the question and answers or in the chat, um, and we will do our best to, to get you unstuck so that you can make the most of the rest of it. Um, and just a wee note here to say thank you to Martina, who's kindly volunteered um, to keep an eye on the chat and on the questions. Um, so if she's the one that gets back to you, she's not overstepping. I've asked her to do that. I've also given her a license to interrupt me if it seems like something's gone wrong with the technology or if there's a really pressing question that a lot of people are confused about. So thank you, Martina, for, for doing that. I really appreciate you taking on that role. We're going to take regular breaks to apply what we're learning to our own plots. Um, so every now and then I'll give you 10 minutes to go and work on your own plot. We'll do that three times. Um, feel free to either work on your plot or to go and grab a coffee. You, you know, whatever you need to do to help you process this. We're here, we've got three hours um, ahead of us if we want to use all the three hours. Um, and it's a lot of information. So take the stuff that you think is useful um, and work with it and just make this workshop work for you. You know, the, the aim really is that by the end of it, you should have greater confidence in the plots that you're creating um, and that you should have a better version of a plot that, that you've come here with if you've brought one with you. Um, as I said earlier, I'm more than happy to give a bit of feedback. So if you want to email me a plot, um, you can do that uh, dur during the breaks and I'll do my best to take a look um, and, and get back to you. Um, throughout the code, I'm using namespacing. So I'm putting the name of the package, then the double colon, and then the function. Um, and I'm doing this for two reasons. Uh, one, it'll help you see where I've got my functions from if you want to retrace the, the steps that I've taken. Um, and two, it's just good practice when you're writing code. I would really encourage you to do this. Um, it avoids you getting conflicts between packages where you, you know, you load, if you load your packages in a different order, you can get a different result, uh, which is which is frustrating to, to troubleshoot. So I recommend that you do this in your own packages, uh, in your own code, but I'm just doing it here to make it easier to, to follow along. Choose your own pipe. Um, we've got the option of the old one or the new one. I quite like the old one. So I'm going to stick with the old one in the code, but feel free um, to, to choose your own pipe um, if you want to. Um, and reuse as much of the code that I'm going to be sharing as you like. And that's what it's here for. Um, the whole point of these workshops is that you should go away with a good toolkit that you can reuse. Um, so yeah, go ahead and do that if you like. Um, so there's a question there about downloading the slides. You can't download them, but you can view them and share them. Uh, they're HTML slides, um, so they're all stored on, on GitHub for you to use if you want. So um, let's get started. Um, we talked earlier about being less dependent on annotations by using intuitive colors. Uh, what, what does that mean? Those of you who have come from the world of uh, linguistics or psychology might have come across this question. Which one is Booba and which one is Kiki? Um, there's a fairly clear international consensus uh, that the one with the really sharp edges and um, the sharp spikes is Kiki. Um, there's something about the, the way that we hear these sounds and that we think about them that makes us identify um, these shapes with names. And this, is, this was a term of uh, sound symbolism was, was coined uh, by Wolfgang Köhler back in 1929. Um, and it's something that is still being researched Today. Um, the number of shapes has increased, the number of arbitrary names has increased, um, but people are still fascinated by this phenomenon of sound symbolism um, and, and what drives it. And what we're going to try to do here um, is play a quick game to illustrate how we can use colour symbolism in our plots, um, not to make our plots into a guessing game, um, but to help people very quickly see and remember uh, what the main pattern is here. So, um, we're going to play a game which is based on an adventure um, for which I require you to suspend all disbelief. Um, the, the penguins, um, a couple of weeks ago, decided to run their own version of the Bake Off, and they set themselves a challenge 
um, of creating the tastiest banana loaf. Um, and we're going to do a little bit of their story. I've made some plots um, and I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, and so if you would like to take part in this game, there is a bar of chocolate to be won. Um, and Martina is going to keep track of our answers as best she can. Uh, you will need to type into the chat either A, B or C in response to the questions that I'm going to be asking. So fingers on the buzzers. Here we go. Um, the Great British, uh, no, sorry, not Great British Bake Off, the Great Penguin Bake Off. So the penguins, as I said, had a baking competition to see which species could make the best banana loaf. Um, and each species was given, given a different uh, type of banana, bananas of different level of ripeness. Um, so if we see just this plot here, there's not much that we can tell from it. But um, if I change the colours a little bit, um, which species do you think was given the overripe uh, bananas? So either A for the Adelis, B for the Chinstrap, or C for Gentoo. Excellent. People are going for it. So the overripe bananas, yeah, exactly. There seems to be a consensus around C. Um, so that was the, the brown colour represents the overripe bananas. Um, and then the Adelie penguins, they got the green bananas. They decided to experiment with different quantities of banana in their mix. Um, and each island of the Adelie penguins decided to go for a different quantity. Um, which ones had the strongest concentration of green banana in their cake? Um, a, B or C? Yeah, A, great. <laughs> That's really clear in the chat. Everyone's getting that one right. Brilliant, oh, well um, done. Got up. Yeah. We need to have a, a bit of a pause between the questions because I do not know where the answering started for this question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, I think that with that one, we started with a whole bunch of A's. So once we see the consensus of A's, that'll be that one. Okay, tell you what, I will type something in the chat. Demarcate them. Um, next question. They decided to go on a retreat to plan their bakes in different locations. And so we've got uh, an English countryside, we've got the centre of Paris, and we've got a ski resort. Um, which, uh, where, which species of penguin went on uh, to a ski resort to plan their bakes? Yeah, excellent, this is working. Yeah, lots of C's coming from in the chat. Perfect. And then one day, the next question. Um, they were allowed to invite a different mentor. Um, so we, do you remember the mentors from the, the, the Bake Off? And uh, we had Mary Berry, Preleaf, and Paul Hollywood. So which species uh, went with Paul Hollywood as their mentor for the Bake Off challenge? Might be slightly niche knowledge. Yes, excellent. We can see the Paul Hollywood fans coming through in the chat. Very good. So that was A. Uh, you're recognizing the kind of silver hair and the blue eyes that made it into the, the uh, chart somehow. And then next question. And finally, they were allowed to choose a different type of snack to enjoy uh, between their practice bakes. Um, so we have some fish and chips, some sardines, and some sushi. Uh, which species went for sushi? Again, A, B, or C. Bit more mixed. Yeah, B. B is the sushi colours. Um, I guess there's different types of sushi, so maybe that's where I went wrong with the with the colours of these, but I think we've got a few more bees um, than everything else. And our last bonus question, um, which is about the baking duration. So they bake their cakes for different amounts of time, um, and here's the mean durations per species. Um, so I'm going to ask you um, about the comparison of these different um, baking durations. And I think with this plot, I find myself kind of putting my head to one side to try and figure out which one's tallest and which one's smallest. Uh, baking durations seem to work best this way around. So which species took their bakes out of the oven first? C. Yeah, well done. Great. Well done, everyone. Um, yes. So <laughs> Martina has hopefully kept track of who answered what. It's just a bit of fun. It's just a bar of chocolate. But hopefully we can uh, find a winner and we'll talk about that in the um, after our next break to give us a lot of time to digest all of that. And um, so that brings us to the end of our round of Great Penguin Bake Off. And hopefully um, it just helps us to illustrate this point of using colours well in our plots um, with some um, purposeful use of colour and orientation so that it's really obvious without us needing to say too much what's going on in our plots. So without further ado, let's get coding so we can apply all of this to some GG plots. 
Um, I'm going to be using the Tooth Growth data set. Um, I'm using this one because it's built into R, so you don't have to install any other packages in order to use it. Um, and you can easily reproduce all that we're doing here. Um, it's quite a fun data set. Uh, you know, you're looking at how much the teeth of the guinea, guinea pigs grew um, according to whether they were fed vitamin C or orange juice. And it's an excuse to use a cute GIF um, at the start of the presentation, which is, you know, always a fun thing to do. Um, I'm going to share a few tips with you um, as we go. Um, and I'm using Cordo slides. And for each, um, each bit of code, I, I'm going to show the output next to it so you can see exactly what's changing in the code and what consequences that has for the plot that's coming out alongside it. And I'm hoping that this is a nice way for you to be able to retrace your steps. If there's something that you wanted to revisit, it should make it really clear what, what caused what. So here is our initial plot. And um, all we're doing, um, GitHub code link for the code. Uh, the code is all inside the slides. And if you go to the link earlier, um, you can copy it really easily. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll add the full code to the plots um, to my site afterwards. I think somebody's not on mute. So if you could try and mute yourselves, that would be, that would be really helpful. Um, so we've got the tooth growth data set. We're grouping it by supplement, which is the vitamin C or the orange juice, and by dose. Um, and then we are summarizing uh, to get a mean length of tooth that has come out from that. And then we're plotting that as a bar plot. And um, hopefully everybody's following up to this point. Um, we're then going to add position equals dodge to put the bars next to each other rather than on top of each other, because it doesn't really make sense to look at them on top of each other um, in this visualization. I'm going to add a white outline um, around the boxes just to separate them out uh, visually for us and I'll make that outline a bit thicker using the size. Um, and then my first mini tip is to get rid of abbreviations. So we're going to go back to the data um, and within the data, we're going to say that we're creating a new column uh, called supplement and we're using case when. So if you've not used case when before, um, it's basically a nicer version of if else. Um, in which you can feed several conditions into it um, and you have true as the catch-all for if anything didn't meet the conditions that you're feeding in. So we're going to say if the supplement was OJ, make it orange juice. If it was VC, make it vitamin C and that will make our plot um, easier to read. So let's see what's happened once we've done that. But we also need to make sure that we change what we're feeding into the plot. So previously we were feeding in sup and dose. We need to feed in supplement and dose, and then we need to make it sure that we're coloring it by supplement rather than just by sup. Um, and we have a plot that's the same, but we have made the text um, a little bit less guessworky for our readers, which is always worth trying to do. Next step, use theme minimal. That would be my recommendation for a good place to start if you want to just get rid of that grading background, which we all have grown to, to love uh, with GG plots, but minimal just gives it a little bit of a cleaner um, starting point. Um, and then we're also going to make the dose um, a categorical variable, which I appreciate is controversial, uh, but because the research was looking at three different doses, um, I think that's okay we get away with it this time around. I will come back to scatter lots of people who are really concerned that I've done something terrible uh, with summary data here. Um, then I'm going to wrap it. So I'm going to put the two sets of bars in two different facets. Um, and just create one column for all of that. So I'm separating out by supplements. We've got orange juice at the top and vitamin C at the bottom. And then we're going to add in some text. Finally, we've not done any annotating yet. So let's just add a bit of text in. We have got a title, we've got a subtitle, um, and uh, we've also changed the axis text. So we're saying the dose and we're saying it's mean length. We're giving the unit, which is always a nice touch as well. Um, and there we have our fairly functional and basic plot, which has all the information that we need to. Um, and we've created it and it's great, but I'm finding myself feeling a little bit like this kitten looking at all the information there. There's just a lot to process. You know, the, the text doesn't really stand out in a way that's uh, particularly helpful. Um, you don't really remember easily which one's at the top, which one's at the bottom. Um, and trying to compare them like that is all a bit mad. So let's see how we can improve um, on this. We're going to use colour purposefully and I'm going to start with some orange juice because we're talking about orange juice and vitamin C and that's nice and easy. So orange juice is orange, great, uh, we, we can do that, that's fine. 
And uh, vitamin C is also orange. So we need to think about this one. But I feel like vitamin C is slightly more red. It's got a kind of more aggressive color to it. And you can almost kind of taste the color uh, when you see it. So we'll try and find a more aggressive red uh, to deal with. And then I just thought this was a nice photo, a nice composition. Those green leaves stand out nicely with these colors. So that might be a nice color to use as the basis for our text. Um, and so what we can do at this point is go and um, copy the image. And then we can go to image color picker. And we'll say, use your image and paste it in. Um, and from that, we can click on the various bits of the plot um, to grab an orange that we think is a nice starting point for our colors. Uh, we can grab a kind of more aggressive, slightly redder orange for the, the vitamin C, and we can take a nice bit of green that we can then modify um, to create the colors for our, uh, our text. Let's get back to the presentation and see what we can do with that. So I created a package a while ago called Monochroma uh, because I was interested in the idea of how we could blend different colors together and how we could create color palettes that went from one to another and also that went kind of darker and lighter. So that's the package that I'm using here. Um, we're going to use our orange juice fab 909, which I think is just a brilliant um, hex code <laughs> for the orange juice color. Um, and then I'm starting from one of our darker bits of orange and I'm blending in some red. Um, and that's giving us a kind of ready orange color in the middle here, which we're going to use for the vitamin C. And then, as I said earlier, I quite like that green and how it stood out with the orange. So I'm going to use the green as the basis for our dark text. Um, so this isn't black, it's just slightly off black, um, but in a way that ties in nicely with what was in that photo. And then from that darker color, uh, which you can see the hex code here is the same as the one that we're starting with here. I'm going to go lighter and um, to give us a bunch of different grays that we can use for the lighter text in our plot. See everybody still with me um, in how we've, we've done that. So we've grabbed some colors that we liked and then we have manipulated them using monochroma um, to make sure that we have a set of colors that all work together that are based from that, that original um, image. And here's what we're gonna be working with. So this is our vitamin C palette um, and I'm creating a named vector um, in order to apply this to the plots. I'll come back to why that's important to do. Um, but for now, you can see we've got the orange juice color and we've got the vitamin C color. We've got a lighter text color and a darker text color. And that will help us add a bit of text hierarchy to our, our plots. So back to the plot um, and let's add our colors in. A uh, question about the monochrome package, does it display colors like that? Yes, it does. Um, that was partly because I could never remember the magic incantations that you were supposed to call in order to bring your colors up in the, the viewer. Um, so yeah, monochrome view palette is the function that you need in order to do that. Um, and the handy thing about this is that it's a ggplot object. So you can then feed it into um, Colorblinder, which checks for how it looks for people with different visual perception. Uh, I'll come back to that again um, later. But yeah, and hopefully other people will find it as useful um, as I hope they would. Um, so here we go, we are back to our plot and we're going to add our colors into it. The easy way to do that is just to add scale fill manual and to type in the colors that we had decided on earlier. Um, that's great, but it's a shortcut and it's a dangerous shortcut and I'm going to show you why. Um, here is the scenario. You have created your plot, you've got it all nice and sorted, and then you've gone on annual leave. And in the meantime, some keen bean in your team has spotted that actually, oh no, catastrophe, supplements should have been a factor. I've, I've just reworked that for you. I've made it into a factor uh, and I've changed the levels. And wait a minute, if you now look at the plot, it now says that the vitamin C is the color that the orange juice was. And the orange juice is the color that the vitamin C was. Well, keep your eye on the plot and you can see that the, the bars and the legend are flipping around just on the basis of the, the factor having been added there. So, we don't want that to happen. Um, and the way to safeguard against that is to use a named vector instead. So you remember our vitamin C palette um, is the vector that we were using and that had orange juice equals the orange juice hex code and vitamin C equals the vitamin C hex code inside it. And um, so once we've done that, everything is restored. 
Um, and we see we've got the vitamin C associated with the right colour and the orange juice associated with the right colour um, again. Now, we've also got some other colours in there that we're not interested in seeing in the plot. We don't want to give people the light text and the dark text and the legend. So we'll come back to how we rescue that later. But the key advantages of doing this, you always know that the colours are applied to the right data points. Um, you keep your colour data pairings consistent throughout a project. So you can reuse that vitamin C colour palette on all of the plots. You don't have to copy paste any hex codes anywhere, which is great, because then if you decide, actually, I don't like that orange, I'm going to make it you know, purple or whatever. And um, you only have to do that in one place. And um, you can, those of you who are interested in writing packages, you can package up the palette. You know, anything that you create, um, you can add into a package. So that's, that's one thing that we've done um, in the past. Um, and you can also reuse the colours in the text with a um, markdown, and I'll show you how we do that um, in a bit as well. So there we go. We've got our named vector. We've got our colours um, ending up in the right order. Um, we're going to use limits equals force to get rid of those text colours because we don't want those to be inside the legend. The limits equals force just means it doesn't use, it doesn't add into the legend colours that are not being used in the plot. Um, then we're going to use the transparency of the bars as a proxy for the quantity of banana that was added. Uh, no, not banana. We're not on the banana anymore. Quantity of vitamin C and orange juice that these guinea pigs were being fed. But the job of doing that is that the, the most faded bars become really difficult to see. So we want to control the, the range of the transparency. Um, and we can do that again using scale alpha. Um, as you can see here, so this sets the lower end of the transparency as 0.33 and the upper end as 1, um, which makes it easier to, to still see the, the lightest of the bars. Um, and then finally, we're going to make sure that the dose is nice and clear. Um, you don't want to have to keep looking up the tooth growth data set um, help in order to figure out what the dose is. So we're going to add a function into the labeling of our x axis. So the function is a fairly straightforward one. We take x and we paste x and milligrams per day because that's the unit that was uh, being used. Um, and once we've done that, we should end up with 0.5 milligrams per day, one milligram per day, and two milligrams per day. Let's check that that's what we've got. Um, and it is, but it's small, <laughs> but it's there, trust me. Um, we've got the units printed in there again, which is helpful. Finally, we're going to get rid of that legend. It was always redundant um, because it's just faceted. Um, so we don't need the, the legend in there. We've got labels elsewhere. Now, some people have very strong opinions about legends. If you absolutely want to keep it, absolutely fine by me. I'm just trying to show you how you can try and declutter as much as you can in your plot. Um, and finally, I'm going to flip the coordinates because I find it so much less confusing trying to compare the lengths of the bars this way around. Uh, your eye is much e easier able to um, draw the lines here and see that this one sticks out past the second one here and that this bottom one sticks out past the bottom one here as well. And it's just all about making it easier for your readers to do the comparisons that you want them to do uh, so that they can then remember the story that's associated with your data. So there we go, it's so much clearer already and we haven't even done any annotating other than adding in a title and a subtitle. And hopefully you're all on board that that was a worthwhile exercise and uh, just plucking out some colors that resonate with what it is that we're looking at. And, um, you know, without reading the labels, you know that the top one is orange juice, the bottom one is vitamin C, and you can then remember the story much more easily um, from that point onwards. I'm going to hand over to you um, in a little bit, but first I want to give you some tips before I get you, let you loose on choosing your own colors, because that's going to be your first task to go and find some colors that you want to use um, in your plots. Um, it's just important to remember that it's about making it easier to remember what's what. Um, so you might not be doing research on something that has um, a really obvious link like that. You know, you're probably not looking at orange juice and vitamin C in, in guinea pigs. And um, so we might need a bit more conceptual work to, to go into those colors. But I just want it to be clear that I'm not trying to turn your plots into a guessing game. All I'm trying to do is reduce the cognitive load for your readers so they don't have to keep checking across with the legend. Um, while they try and read what the, the plots are. But picking colours is really hard. I find it really hard too. Um, and so my top tip is to let other people help you. Um, and here's how. You might have some brand guidelines or some department guidelines that you can fall back on when you're designing your plots and creating a colour system for yourselves. 
Um, they will rarely have the semantic associations that we've just talked about, um, but they can be a good starting point, um, particularly if you want to use monochroma to blend in a bit of your department colour to the, the semantic colours that you're coming up with, that can give it all a nice unified look. Um, what I like to do is start from a photo um, or a piece of art and something like Image Colour Picker to pick out the, the colours that are there. Um, and obviously that was a very literal example that we did there. So, um, and it was also very literal earlier when we were doing our Penguin Bake Off. And um, these are the photos that went into creating the plots um, that we used to, to guess uh, where, the, where the penguins were going and which mentor they had chosen um, and so on and so forth. But here are a few other examples. This is a project where I was working with people who were looking at how trustworthy videos were seen to be based on whether they had been made by a human or whether they had been completely automated. Um, and so I created a, a machine colour, which is that kind of steely blue, and a human colour, which I kind of thought of as a kind of pinky brain, you know, orangey pinky brain colour, um, which is the kind of colours that you see a lot if you Google images of, uh, of AI. Um, and then I fed that into monochroma to end up with three colours uh, because they also had a middle condition, which was whether the video was partly automated and partly human made. Um, and I think this helped when you saw the graphs, it helped you see very quickly which one was which. And if nothing else, it allowed me a little chuckle as well about uh, more machine now than that. But don't make, um, what is it, evil and twisted, uh, twisted and evil plots. We're, we're all about making our plots nice and clear um, for, for our readers. Here's another one that... I did fairly recently for a company called Recast, um, and I've popped their logo on there. So you can see what I did. I, I first found a colour that was um, the colour of their logo, and then I blended a little bit of the colour in there. This was a company that was looking at financial forecasting, and they wanted a colour for sales. So I went with the kind of gold um, money coming in. They wanted something for growth, so I went with green, but again, blended in a bit of their logo colour um, and something for loss. Um, and again, that colour ties in with the rest of it. So that when people were seeing their dashboards, it was really clear very quickly and um, what they were looking at. Um, and finally, this is a project that I really enjoyed working on um, just very recently for someone who was based in um, British Columbia. Um, and so I took a photo from there um, and tied the various colours in with, you know, um, who the different participants were again in the dashboard, whether it was you know, the old system, the new green system, uh, people who, who were taking the view from the top of the mountain, uh, or people who were kind of more on the grounds and got that kind of orange brown and the, the kind of darker blue colours that were associated with those um, as well. So it, it's not always something that's as obvious as the bananas and the orange juice and the vitamin C, but hopefully it still anchors things in a way that people can easily identify what's what and remember it, even if it wasn't um, initially obvious without you having to explain it. And um, sometimes you might be in a situation where you don't know how many colours you need, um, or where the colours just don't really tie in with anything. Um, in that case, consistency is going to be your key. Um, and as I said, take inspiration from photos or other data viz or even some art that you like. Um, not that I'm at all obsessed with the Bake Off, but here is a plot that I made recently. And all the colours in that plot are based on this photo, which I think is possibly one of the happiest photos um, that you can find um, online. You've got a lot of colours from Prue's shirt that made it into the, the icing. Then you've got the actual icing that I think is based on the icing in Jürgen's little bowl over here. Um, and on top of that, you've got a bit of the tent uh, coming into the background as well. Um, Hector, thank you for your question. You're asking, are there guidelines for making colour palettes uh, colourblind accessible? Yes, and we'll talk about that in, in just a minute. Um, here's another one that I've been working on recently. Again, the research group um, doesn't know necessarily how many colours they're going to be needing. Um, and so it was a question of finding a group of colours that worked well, that scaled well for accessibility as well, um, and that reflected nicely the ethos of what they were looking at. I'm going to be talking more about this in a couple of days in a lightning talk about database design systems, if you're interested in finding out more about that. You can also use Google Images and look for whatever you like palette. So being based in Edinburgh, I thought I should give this a go. Uh, here is the Edinburgh colour palette. Um, it's quite fun to see that Dolly the Sheep is the, <laughs> the first colour um, that made it into that. And um, Festival Blue is something that we'll be seeing a lot more of over the coming months. Um, but you try anything, you know, sunflowers or peacocks or, you know, whatever it is that you that you like the colour of. And um, someone will have come to the, the realisation that there's a good colour palette to be made from it. And then you can um, start basing some of your plots on that um, as well. If you really like the purest approach and would rather start from the colour wheel and read around how best to use it, I highly recommend this blog post that I've linked at the bottom here 
um, on, from Data Wrapper on how to use colors well in your plots and using a tool like Paladon really helps. Um, let me just show you what that looks like if it'll load. There we go, that's fine. Um, so here is the tool um, and you can see you need three colors, you need them related, you need them different, or you need four colors. Um, when I first started looking at this, naively I thought that the more spaced out your colors were, um, the easier it was going to be to, to create a good plot. And um, actually you end up looking a little bit like a kind of nursery or a primary school um, in, the, in the branding of that. What happens is if you tie, if you bring the colors a little bit closer together, and um, you still get some nicely distinct colors, but they're a bit more you know, grown up in the way that they, they work with each other, which I think is a, a nice touch and something to consider. But as I said, have a look at the data wrapper blog post that I've linked there because it's one of the best ones that I've found um, on all of this. Again, quick tip for viewing your colors. And uh, we talked about this earlier, monochroma view palette, um, which as I said, spits out the ggplots object um, and make sure that you name them as well. Um, and a few things to bear in mind, accessibility. So thank you, Hector, for um, using that, uh, for mentioning that. That's a really important point. We make, need to make sure that our plots are readable by people who've got um, different types of color perception. Um, and there are ways that we can test that. So there are a few tools that we can use. If you want to stay within the R world, um, Colorblinder um, is a great package for doing that. It's no longer, I think, accessible and um, available on Crown, but you can download it um, using the, the GitHub install um, from the, the creator's GitHub page. Um, and if you go to that GitHub page, there's instructions on, on how to do that if you've not done that before. Um, but yeah, what it allows you to do is feed the ggplot that you've just created into this function. Um, and it spits out um, plots that mimic what, these, what your plot would look like to people who've got different types of color perception. Um, so I, I recommend using this because sometimes you create a palette that works well um, on an online tool. Um, there's a few, um, you know, Chroma, Chroma.js, I think, um, palette checker. I'll pop a link to that later as well. Um, but you can, sometimes it looks great if there are clear blocks of colors, but if you're making it as a scatter block, for example, and your dots are quite small, suddenly it's less easy to see what's going on. So I recommend trying to actually simulate it with your, your plot and seeing what it looks like. And um, colorcontrast.cc is also really good um, when it comes to looking at text colors against a background. Um, and it's quite a fun interface um, where you can kind of see that obviously the black text here against the, the white is failing um, on, on all counts. Uh, oh, but you can, you can move things around um, and try and rework it until it passes on all the levels. Maybe lime green isn't what I would recommend um, as a background for your plots, but um, yeah, all options to, to explore. So accessibility is important. Um, the other thing to bear in mind that I would highlight is if you're doing things to do with race and ethnicity, obviously avoid stereotypes and be mindful of unintended messages. Um, say, for example, the logo from your organization is green. Um, I would maybe avoid making any of the groups that you're talking about the green color in your plots just because that will highlight them um, standing out from the others. Although if your organization is one that is particularly looking to work with a, a particular group of people, then that would be a, a perfectly fine thing to do. But just be, just be aware of how your colors might be interpreted by the people viewing your plots. And finally, color intensity. Uh, I would say more is more. So if you're wanting to show there is more of something, go for a more punchy color. And um, if there is less of something, um, then you can go for a, a more faded, uh, less intense color. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you guys at this point for, for a quick 10 minute break um, where I'm going to ask you to think about the concepts in your own data and try to find some images that you think are related to these concepts. Or if you don't think that's something that will work for you, um, try to find some images that you like and um, that fit nicely with your own aesthetics. Um, extract the color codes that you need using Image Color Picker or another tool if you are used to using a different one. Um, and then name them and check what they look like together using monochroma as we looked at earlier, and then try to assess them using Colorblinder and um, CVD grid as well. So without further ado, you have 10 minutes. I will kick around if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the, the Q&A um, or in the chat. And obviously if you have a plot that you want me to take a look at, then uh, feel free to send me an email as well. Yeah, let's start these 10 minutes. Grab yourselves a coffee um, and go and find some images that you like and we'll regroup after that.
Okay, we have a minute left. So if you're still wrestling with your colors, now is the time to stop the soul searching and make a decision. <laughs> and you can always make another decision again in half an hour's time. <laughs> Okay, we're at the end of the break. Hopefully, those of you who went to get coffee are now back um, with us. I hope that was helpful for you to just get a bit of time to, to process what we've been talking about um, and, yeah, apply it, hopefully, to, to your own your own plots. Um, Martina has managed to figure out who won a great Penguin Bake Off game. So, Martina, if you could announce our winner, that would be great. Yes, uh, the very clear winner. There was one person who was three times the quickest with the correct answer, and that's Katie Merriman. Excellent. Well, well done, Katie. And um, if you could email either me or, or Martina, um, we'll sort out the details for how to get that bar of chocolate to you uh, wherever you are in the world. And um, hopefully, that'll be a nice little souvenir from <laughs> from this workshop. Uh, but yeah, thanks for thanks for playing. Um, the second thing that we're going to talk about now in this workshop is how to add some text hierarchy to our plots. And um, that text hierarchy is one of those things that is so much easier to demonstrate than it is to explain. So take a quick look at this. Um, this image has text that is formatted in different ways. And the way that the text is formatted draws your eye um, to some things as being more or less important than each other. Um, and the big text is the stuff that you're going to be reading first, but it's not just about the size of the text, it's also about colours, and it's about italics, it's about where the text is placed, and so on and so forth. And what we want to do as um, people who create data visualisations is harness this so that we are making the main story of our plots stand out to the people who are looking at them. You remember the plot that we created earlier? It was just a little bit busy. So we're going to go back to that and see how we can rework that. Um, and to rework it, we need to start playing with theme. Uh, so the theme function is part of the ggplot package, um, and you can modify basically anything that you want uh, within your plot. I take part in the Tidy Tuesday Challenge, which has been a great way of creating all sorts of zany plots, but it also shows you um, just how to manipulate pretty much everything that you could try to manipulate within a plot. So if those of you who want to level up on your plots, um, I highly recommend taking part in Tidy Tuesday as a way of doing that with, with plots where you can very rarely put your foot in something um, serious. So uh, we've got our basic plot, uh, which is the one that we created earlier. And I've just created a basic plot object that we can call and continue modifying. And um, that's just so that it's easier when we're looking at the code, it doesn't get too cluttered with all the code that we've already written. So here was our basic plot. Um, and we had theme minimal already um, as part of the plot there. Um, and what we can do is build on that by adding more theme arguments. So the first thing we're going to do is just actually get rid of the, the legend by using legend position equals none. Um, and then we're going to change the color of the text. Now, this is really subtle. Okay, so keep your eye on the text and you'll see it gets a little bit more faint um, with that second slide. Um, and we're using the light text color that we created earlier as part of our vitamin C palette, if you remember, we had the orange juice, the vitamin C, a dark text, and a light text. So we're just using that and feeding it into element text. And then element text applies that color to all of the text inside our plot. Um, and we're then going to override that in the title um, to make the title slightly darker. Again, I appreciate this is really subtle um, at this stage. But then we're going to start doing some more fun things. So we can change the size of the text um, to make the title bigger. Highly recommend using relative sizes, um, especially if you're going to be using plots that you're creating in different spaces. Um, you can use the relative size and it changes the size of everything compared to your base size that you feed in um, at the start. So uh, this means that if you suddenly realize that in all your plots, the, the text is just slightly too small, you can change the, the base text size inside element text 
um, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Um, and all the rest of the sizes will adapt accordingly. So don't go and set absolute sizes, otherwise you have to change your code in loads and loads of different places. And then we're going to make the text bold in our title, again, to make that stand out. And we're then going to add some fonts. Uh, so I'm using Cabin as the font for most of the text, and then Enriqueta for the font for the, the title. And um, again, just to add a little bit of variability in there. Once we've done that, we can we now understand the principle, so we can apply it to the strip text, which is the title of our facets. So again, uh, we're using the, the light text, we're making it bold, we're making it slightly bigger, changing the font, um, and we're also doing the same thing with the axis text. Now, I said earlier that element text changes all the text in your plot. The trouble is the theme minimal has some opinions about what color text should be as well. So if you're using theme minimal as your starting point, oh, this seems to be getting cool. Apologies for that. Um, so if you're using theme um, minimal as a start, it has some um, colors that are inside it. Um, and so you want to overwrite them again in your access, access text, which is what we're doing here. Um, so that's that sorted. And then the important thing at this point is to acknowledge that choosing fonts is really tricky. Um, I think most of us that have gone into data visualization have not come from a graphic design background. Uh, but thankfully, there are loads of graphic designers around who provide some really, really useful resources that we can fall back on. So as I said earlier, you might have some brand guidelines um, within your department that you can use. Someone would have done a bit of thinking about which fonts work well together. Uh, but you need to make sure that these fonts work well in the context of visualizations. You don't want it to be either fonts that are too narrow or too wide, um, and you want them to be easily readable. Um, so it's worth thinking about the types of fonts that work well in user interfaces, for example, where you typically have quite a lot of information and that needs to be uh, really easy to see. Um, so you've got your fonts that you can choose. You can also have a look at what other people have used in their websites um, and use the inspector tool. For those of you who are not familiar with that, it blew my mind when I first saw it. So I'm going to um, pass on that favor. Uh, you right click and you have a look at inspect. Um, and then once you've done that, you can type in here um, and that brings up the font that people are using. Can we see the inspector tool over Zoom? Martina, keep me right. Um, there should be a bunch of code at the bottom of my slides. Yeah, you can see that. Okay, great. So um, again, if you find yourself on a website and you think that's a nice combination, um, you can have a look at that. I really recommend Oliver Schundorfer um, as a, a person who provides great resources on this. He's got a good font matrix. Um, web um, page that helps explain why fonts work or don't work together. Um, and he has quite a nice newsletter as well, which suggests fun fonts um, if you want to really become uh, a font nerd uh, among your peers in data visualization. Some of us would see that as a badge of honor, but well, well that's probably to be debated. Um, getting custom fonts to work in R can be really, really frustrating. So I'm going to acknowledge that. Um, but things have come a long way recently. So if you have tried to do this previously and just found yourself um, not getting anywhere, um, then there is hope um, on the horizon. So system fonts has changed things quite a lot. Um, and the way that you're supposed to do it is you install your fonts locally, and then you'll probably need to restart our studio once you've done that, just so that it's aware of things. And um, have the system fonts packet installed. And when you install that, it should also install um, rag and text shaping. And then you need to set, set your graphics device to AGG and cross your fingers and everything should work. Uh, fine. I've done a bunch of troubleshooting on this. So again, a few steps so that you don't have to do that yourself. Here is what I mean by setting your graphics device. Um, so you will find inside your RStudio options in your general options and um, the option to change the graphics device here with this little drop down. Um, so have a look at that and make sure that you've got AGG as your setting um, and that will make your fonts play nicely. Um, if you're using um, fonts inside a R Markdown or a Quarto document. Again, this took me far too long to troubleshoot. So um, this is a quick solution for you. You need to add dev equals rag underscore PNG to your um, starting chunk. You know, when you set all your options at the start of a Markdown document. And again, that means that you don't end up with the frustrating thing of your plots looking absolutely fine in the viewer and fine when you GG save and not rendering with the fonts in your Markdown documents or your quarter document. Um, I'm not entirely sure why the mechanics of it, but I know that this is the solution. So hopefully that will get you right. 
Um, but you can still end up feeling a lot of affinity for Ron Swanson um, in this scene as he chucks out his computer. And um, if you're there, and um, or if you just want to find out more about using custom fonts, highly, highly recommend this uh, post by June Cho about using um, custom fonts in R. Um, yeah, he's just put some really, really useful tips there on things that I did not know you could do with fonts. Um, that uh, yeah, again, stuff to play around with but mostly stuff to troubleshoot where you are if you're just trying to use a font that's not, uh, not working. So at this point in the presentation, we've got a set of uh, fonts that we're using, and um, we've got a set of colors and a few rules um, as well. And so we're really halfway towards a database design system, which is a set of rules that you can follow so that all your plots look on brand every time and you've already considered the accessibility um, side of it. And I'm going to be talking about that again in a few days' time. Um, and I've popped a link at the bottom of the slides. That link is not live yet. Um, I will add something to it tomorrow um, to make sure that it's there uh, with a the recording of the talk. But you will, um, by this point, you know, you've done a lot of work to figure out this plot. And it's quite rare in a research project that you would only be creating one plot. You're probably going to be creating several of them. So it's worth saving you some energy by making those decisions about which colors you're going to use for what, which fonts you're going to use. Um, and then you don't have to revisit that every time you make a plot. Um, and if you're doing it in R, then you can implement it so that it all happens with a couple of lines of code as well, which is, which is really good fun. Um, and again, we've got accessibility. We've got meaningful colors within the context. We've got a bit of visual identity. Um, which is helpful when you're publishing across lots of different outlets. It just kind of brings everything back um, very clearly into your team. Um, and as I said, you can implement it as, as an R package, uh, which is good. So um, once we've created our plot, we've changed the title font and the text font. Uh, we've got a good amount more hi um, text hierarchy going on here than what we had at the start, but we can give everything a little bit of space to breathe. So you can change um, the line height within your title. You can give your title um, a margin. Um, it goes top, bottom, left. No, top, bottom, right, left, I think. No, trouble. <laughs> top, right, bottom, left. Trouble is the way that I try and remember it. I'm glad that didn't work live, but trouble is the way to remember it. So yeah, CRBL um, to get the order of your, your margins sorted there. Um, you can get your plot subtitles sorted in there as well. You can apply the same kind of thing to the axis text and to the strip text. And we can also get rid of the Y um, title. We don't really need it to say dose on the side there, so we can just get rid of that. Um, again, we can change the size of the title, but watch out because there it's just gone off the edge of our plot. Um, so we need to make sure that we've figured out how to fix that. Um, the old way of doing it is to add a whole bunch of line breaks in, which actually is what I've done um, if we look at the code and um, we've created two line, uh, well, just one line break, so it goes onto two lines, but that's not the best way to do it. Um, what you should really consider using um, instead of doing all of this, because if you don't have any line breaks, it just goes straight off the edge, um, is ggtext. So there's so many reasons to love the ggtext package. Um, and one reason that I discovered fairly recently is that you can use element text box simple um, as a way to wrap your title within your plot and the same for the subtitle. Um, now you have to be a little bit careful in terms of the, the margins to make sure that, that you don't get two boxes that overlap with each other and the way that you justify your text, et cetera. But it just saves a whole bunch of time of figuring out where should I break that line uh, because it breaks the line for you in a way that makes it all fit inside the plot. So consider using ggtext and um, text box simple and um, for your next plot just to, to save some of that. Um, extra thinking that you have to do. And also, if we're using ggtext, we can have some fun with HTML and CSS. So I'm not going to go too crazy here. We're just going to change a bit of formatting in our title text. Um, but I'm just demonstrating how we do it here. So the bit that's formatted like code is just code. And then the bit underneath it is how it renders. So you can see the first word green here is this one. And all we've done is encased it. Um, inside a kind of opening span and then close span in which we change style to say color is green. And we can change other things. So for this one here, we've changed the font size um, to uh, 60 points, just to show you what it looks like. Um, you probably wouldn't want to do that within a title, but what we can do is use the colors from our vitamin C palette to put the word orange juice in the orange juice color and vitamin C and the vitamin C color. 
Um, it's a nice touch. Um, it makes it, again, a little bit easier when you're orienting yourself with the plot so that you can see, okay, these colors are deliberate. Um, that's good. And you get a feel for what the data is going to show um, and how it relates to the colors inside the plot um, as well. So we can do that and see for yourselves. This is how far we've come with these little tips um, of adding some text hierarchy. It just, it's more inviting. You know, you look at the plot and you don't run away thinking there's too much text. You, you want to read the, the text that's there. Um, I think as humans, we're, I was chatting with somebody in, in the chat there about the, the strip effects and the fact that we are, we just, we're wired to read stuff. We can't not read things. Um, and so we might as well make it easier for people to read the, the important information first uh, when we are creating our plots. So I'm gonna hand over to you um, again for a quick break um, or for uh, some fonts work. Uh, depending on which you think you need the most at this point in time. Um, I'm going to ask you to apply the colors that you chose earlier to your plot, see what that's looking like. Again, if you want to send me something to look at, I'm more than happy to, to do that. Um, you can check what fonts are on your device by using system fonts, system fonts um, and that will uh, open up a data frame that you can view um, and you can filter to find the ones that you're interested in. Um, if you want to install a new font, you can do that. Um, and then you can apply one to the title. Um, you can change things inside the theme. Have a look at your different light and dark colors for your text using monochroma if you want to do that. Um, apply all this, have a play around with relative text sizes, and do give me a shout um, if you get stuck. We've got a question from Roland about, is it possible to add icons to our titles? Yes, if you use um, GG text, you can add emojis. Um, which is what I just did there. Um, but it, yeah, it can get a bit messy. So uh, sometimes it's worth doing it. Sometimes it just distracts from what you're trying to do. But yeah, I'd be interested to see um, what you have in mind and, uh, and what you do with that, that idea. That could be quite fun. So hopefully, uh, Martina, were there any pressing questions that I should answer? Um, no, there was one question about if you want to dive into a bit about making a package, but I think that will come. The, which package, sorry? Uh, you, a few, few slides back, you said on the bottom of the slide, and make a package. Uh, oh, uh, this bit here? Back. No, yeah. a few slides back. Oh, a few slides back, sorry. Yeah. Where were we? Uh, keep going. Some more, some more, some more. This. Oh, this? The yeah. Devices and System. Yeah, so implementing it as an R package. Um, so if you, if you, if you're able to catch my lightning talk in a few days time, I'll talk more about it then. Um, but you can, you can create a scale color, you know, Cara or whatever it was that you want to, to create that will then add that into your package as you use it, add into your plots as you use them. Um, and you can also create your own theme function that you can then apply. I will talk about that when we come back from the break. So if you, during the break, get a theme that you're happy with, um, and we will then package that up as a function um, so that you can see how you can reuse that um, across several plots um, after that. I hope that answers the, the question. Um, but yeah, I'll try and populate this link that I've put at the bottom of the slide, um, and then people can take a look at that as well um, in due course. Uh, so had, uh, hmm? yeah, yes, that was answered to the question. It's in the chat, so that's nice. Okay. Um, uh, other question. That's mine. Qu my question of me. Uh, the font I see in your presentation is different than the one I see on your website. Yeah. And uh, why? And can we do yeah, something yeah. to make it the same? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So I. I noticed that just before I started and I was like, I'm not going to try and fix that just before we start. But yeah, that is to do with GitHub pages and where GitHub pages looks for a custom font. And um, so if you're creating things with GitHub pages, um, it, all, it should all work well inside a document. Um, but GitHub pages, for some reason, looks for the font a level higher in the hierarchy from where the presentation is. So I need to make sure that I put my custom font in the place where GitHub pages is looking for it. And um, that's the solution to that, that problem there. So it's not a system plus thing, it's a, it's a GitHub pages issue. Um, yeah, but thank you, I will fix that. <laughs> that's helpful. 
Okay, well, let me get this starter, uh, the timer started. And we've got 10 minutes and um, feel free to do whatever you need during the next 10 minutes. And when we come back, we'll package a few things up um, and then move on to um, annotating the plot with trends and specific um, data points that we're looking at.
Okay, we have 30 seconds left. So if you can regroup, uh, we'll, we'll get cracking with the rest of the presentation soon. Um, I hope what we've covered so far has been helpful. Um, do you give me a shout if we have missed any questions or if there's anything um, that you think it would be good to, to go over um, in more detail and um, yeah, more than happy to pick stuff up offline as well um, if, if there are questions that we don't have time to, to answer within the bounds of this workshop. So hopefully you've had a chance to play around with the theme um, function inside your plot. Um, and we're going to talk now about um, moving on from there. So packaging up. Package development is a whole other workshop. So I don't have time to show you how to make a package, but I will say this, it is much less difficult than you think it is. Uh, people think of package development as this thing that only the super hardcore uh, nerds do, um, but that's not true. It's, it's not that difficult to do it. If you know how to write a function, and then you're most of the way towards writing your own package. Um, I highly recommend um, Shannon's blog post that I've um, popped a link to you again at the bottom of these slides if you're interested in building your own package. It's just a really great way of making it easy for you to retrieve um, functions and objects for yourself um, easily. So I've done that for myself. I can never remember what my brand colors are. I mean, then why should I spend uh, you know, cognitive energy on hex codes? So I've um, created this and then it means that if I want to figure out what my colors are, I just have to call that function from inside uh, my package. Um, which, yeah, it's fun. Um, and yeah, it is a lot easier than you think. But yeah, anything that you've created so far, so you might have created a color palette that you're using in your plot, um, and you, you, we will just talk in a minute about how to create a theme function, and um, you can easily add those into uh, the package and just follow the steps um, that Shannon goes through there. She's giving a workshop at the same time as me today, and um, so I'm kind of gutted to, to be missing that, um, but another, another voice that's well worth listening to um, in the R world. So in terms of um, making things more efficient, even if you don't want to create a package, um, you still might want to create a function because our current status is that we're calling theme minimal and then we're calling theme again and adding probably about 20, um, 20 lines of code to that. Um, and then what we want to do really um, is create a status where we can just call theme guinea pig. So we just add one line of code um, and that will um, yeah, that will solve our plot um, text hierarchy, make our colors consistent within our text and all of that. And um, we have a question in the chat about including the data in package to share. Um, yeah, you, you wanna be careful about what data you include um, and how you're sharing your package with other folks. And um, there are a bunch of, um, you know, if you're just looking to create a, a plot theme um, and color scheme, I would just rely on the packages that we're using here to demonstrate how those work. And um, when I create packages for clients, what I tend to do is use the Palmer Penguins um, package for the data just to demonstrate what different types of plots look like with the theme that I've made for them and the color scheme that I've made for them. And um, the penguins are my favorite, but there, there are a bunch of different packages that you can use. And um, if it's an internal package to your organization, um, then you're probably in a better place to be including some example data that's, that's more relevant to the stuff that you're doing. But just be really careful about where that package is stored and what the privacy is around that um, in case you're leaking data that you that you shouldn't be leaking. Um, yeah, just something to be to be mindful of. And um, all the built-in packages and the common penguins data um, make it easy to, to do this kind of thing without needing to include any data inside your package. So how do we go about creating our theme function? Um, this is essentially here um, the code that we were adding to our plot, right? So all of this. Theme minimal plus theme, change the legend, change, change the text color, change the axes, et cetera, et cetera. What we're going to do is we're going to encase that inside a function that we're calling theme guinea pigs because that's the data that we're looking at and it's a kind of cute name. Um, and this is the trick that I was talking about earlier. We can give it a base text size. So I'm going to say we're using 15 as the base text size. Um, and then that gets read, read into theme minimal as the base size, which means that then any relative sizes that we are applying build on that text size. So we've created a function here in which we can very easily change the, the size of the text if we decide actually the text is looking a bit small across all of my plots. Let's just make it a bit bigger. Equally, sometimes you render a plot and you, make, you have a very small export and the text looks huge and you need to work it the other way around um, as well. 
And a good practice when you're writing functions is to not let it access anything outside of the function itself. So we want to be feeding it the vitamin C palette so that it can then make use of it um, inside. So it's then calling palette.pexcala because we've said that the palette is the vitamin C palette. And again, if you're not familiar with function writing, this might be an extra step, uh, but it's worth considering um, whether this is something that could really increase the efficiency with which you produce plots um, for, for your next project. So at this point, um, we also know um, how to get from here to here, because that's what we've just done. We've created our theme function. So here's our basic plot. And then just to test it out, we're adding it to a completely new set of data. And we've got a plot here that has the same kind of branding as what we had earlier. So even just this step, aside from the colors, um, allows you to quickly make sure that all your plots have a kind of visual consistency. Um, that's not just the visual consistency of, yeah, okay, that's a GG plot, uh, you know, which is not the visual consistency that you're necessarily aiming for. So we've done that, we know how to create a theme um, package. And again, we can talk about that um, offline in more detail if, if that would be helpful. The next thing we're gonna try to do is reduce unnecessary eye movement. So we talked earlier about not having to get our readers to consist, con continuously look between the legend and the, the colors to figure out what's what. So we're gonna add some text boxes in that will help us do that. And um, so we're gonna make it even easier to compare values. Here is our themed plot, which again I've created so that we can build on this rather than including all the theming elements in our code. And um, we're going to just change the gaps. Okay, have a look at the gaps between the text on the y-axis and the bars. Just a little bit easier. You don't have to jump quite so far between the text and the, the start of the bar. Uh, we're going to move the titles of our strip text so that it starts um, at the start of our bar again just to make sure that you're just looking in one place when you're trying to figure out what is this bar that i'm looking at um, and then we're going to add in some text boxes and we're going to do some fun stuff here uh, with some conditional alignment and coloring etc so seat belts on uh, we're going to be using gd text and um, geon text box so we have already told ggplot uh, inside the themed plot that we created, what was going to be the X and the Y coordinates of our bars. So we know the X is the dose and then the Y is the mean length. So we've already got that sorted. What we want to do here is add a text box that just tells us what the mean length is that we calculated um, within that group. So let's see what that looks like. So as you can see, we've added a text box um, that kind of straddles the end of the bar um, and that includes in its label the value that corresponds to the end of the bar. Hopefully that's making sense to people. Um, so all we're doing is creating a text box which sits at the Y coordinate which indicates the end of the bar which contains the, the value that's in there. Um, we can then do a bit of formatting. We'll make the text a bit bigger. Um, and we're going to make sure that we line up the text and the boxes so that they kind of butt against the end of the bar inside the bar using hlign and hjust. Um, this is one, another one of these things that I made because I could never really remember what was what. Uh, but if you have a look at the alignment cheat sheet and um, blog post that I made, it shows you where the boxes sit compared to the, the points that their coordinates um, based on the alignments that you feed it. So we want to make the text um, go to the end of the bar. And then we can also take out, uh, take the box contour away by saying box color is NA. We take the background away by saying fill equals NA. Um, and we have some boxes that are perfectly fine, but I think we can improve on what we have here. Uh, we can give them the same font as everything else. We can change the color to white and we can make them bold so that they stand out a little bit more. So that's all fine, but we've got a bit of a problem um, with the lighter bar in that we can't actually see that number very clearly. I think that would fail a bunch of accessibility tests. So we need to make sure that we have a way of countering that. We also could run into a problem if we were using a different data set and say this bar was much shorter, we wouldn't have space for the text to, to fit in there. So we're gonna add a bit of conditional um, jiggery pokery on this to make sure that our labels sit always in a nice place that makes it easy to see what's going on. So what we're doing here, we're using case when um, to say that if the mean length is less than 15, then we're gonna align it one way around. And if it's greater than 15, we're gonna align it the other way around. And we're doing the same thing 
with H align. So the justification of the box and the alignment of the text inside the box are both going to be conditional on the basically how long the bar is. Um, so there we go. So we've got for bars where the value is smaller than 15, the text is outside of the bar. And where the value is greater than 15, the value is inside the bar. Um, I've made them all black so we could see where they are, because otherwise you would just get white text on a white background here, and this would be very confusing um, to look at. Hopefully the case when thing there makes sense. You're just moving your boxes so that they always sit in a place that makes sense. We are then going to do some fun color stuff. So we're going to say if the mean length is greater than 15, so remember that's when the text is inside the bar, we're going to make the text white. And otherwise, if the text is outside the bar, then we are going to use the color that corresponds to that bar. So for a dark orange bar, we would expect some dark orange text. And for the orange juice bar, we would expect the orange juice color for the text as well. So let's run that and see what's going on. And we do not get what we're expecting at this point. So what's going on here? What's happening is that a um, ggplot has um, decided, rightfully so, that we have fed it some information here and we have actually just given it levels rather than giving it colors. So it thinks that um, this here, why should it interpret it as a color? It's just a string of text. And the same for the supplement that's inside the vitamin C. It doesn't know to use those as colors. It just thinks that it's text. So it's using, you might recognize the, the default ggplot colors that you get if you were to feed um, three, yeah, if you were to feed three um, different um, levels of a variable into ggplot. So we need to fix that. Uh, and to fix that, we just need to use scale color identity. Again, hopefully this is a shortcut. It took me quite a while to troubleshoot this the first time I played around with it. Um, but that means that it's taking the string that we're giving it, so the hex codes, and it's turning it into the color that it is using um, within the plot. So there we go. That's what that looks like. We've now got the text that is the right color for the bar, and we've got it as white text if it sits inside the bar, um, which is yeah, just a, another nice touch. You know, none of this is strictly necessary, but it's about reducing that eye movement, making sure that the readers can see what the value is without having to jump between the x-axis and, uh, and what's going on at the top there. We can then use our, our markdown knowledge that we gained when we were looking at adding kind of span either side of text to, to format it. And we can reiterate what the uh, dose is and we can add a line break. We can even change the size of the font so that this extra little bit of information in terms of our text hierarchy, it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the dose but it's just a little nice reminder for the reader so they don't have to keep jumping back and forth to figure out what it is that they're looking at. So let's look at what that does. Here we go. So we've got some boxes with some text hierarchy inside them, um, which just reiterates to the reader what the dose is. It's the same as what's printed here, but putting it over here just makes it easier to read. They don't have to keep jumping back and forth um, across the, the plot. Um, last trick that we're going to do on this is to use uh, Jana's round half up to make sure that we're rounding the length. Um, I didn't realize I needed this until I tried to demonstrate something clever that I'll show you in a minute, um, at which point I realized I hadn't rounded the values. So we kept getting you know, 0 0.33 recurring, um, which in the label looks really ugly. So we're going to just round, um, round the lengths, and we're just going to round them um, to the nearest whole number um, just for a little bit of ease. Um, and yeah, there we go, we have this plot. And at this point, you might be thinking, that's fine, but why, why on earth would I bother doing this? Um, I could do this um, in Figma. I could just add the labels in on top, or even, you know, MS Paint or whatever tool it is that you want to be using. Um, and that's fine. Oh, we have a question before we move on. Do we think it's important to include the redundant values on the x-axis if you'd included them in the bars? Good question. Um, I think this probably is a personal preference thing, um, and it might also end up being a journal editorial question that some people will have very strong views about the fact that you need to have um, you know the legend and the axes labeled clearly and all that kind of stuff so this I feel is a, a nice touch um, yeah I, I would say you could probably get rid of it uh, but it depends again how you want your readers to process the information if it's important for you that they kind of see three equally valid conditions um, along the the axis um, oh I was thinking about the y-axis yeah in terms of the x-axis again you can get away with removing them or you could um, 
if you wanted to change the number of breaks um, so that you're not including quite as many breaks if you're including the, the value inside the bars. Um, yeah, good question. Thanks, Raymond. Um, in terms of why, why, would you, why on earth would you bother doing this? You could very easily make your plot and then annotate it using a totally different tool, and that's fine. And this is to avoid that scenario where you, your colleague comes to you after you've created all of your beautiful visualizations, you've been really careful about your text hierarchy, placement of the labels, and they say, you know what, that participant, we thought we'd lost their data, we found it, we found it, we can add it back in, we can, we can recreate all the plots with all this extra data in, or whatever it is that's relevant within your field of work. And inside, you know, you'll be thinking, oh, I should really be feeling yes for science, but no, I've just spent so much time getting all my plots sorted. I do not want to have to start all of these labels again from scratch. What we're doing here is kind of proofing you against that situation. You're creating plots in which the labels will automatically update themselves when you get new data coming in. This means that you can start creating your plots earlier on in your research project and you can get a feel for what your data looks like for how you want to visualize it rather than having to wait till the very last um, bit of data collection has happened and obviously you'll want to wait till, till that to get your story straight but you can already start to work on your visualizations um, and save yourself a bit of time as you go that nothing that you do is going to be wasted um, when the, the final data set comes in and here's just a quick demonstration. What I did here is I created new data by just sampling the tooth growth data set. So I took you know, 50 random rows instead of taking the 60 that are in there and regenerated the plots. Um, and as you can see, the, the labels move around in the way that they would need to if you were to, to update your data. And this is also really useful um, if you want to create uh, parameterized reports. I think David Kais is doing a talk on that in this conference as well. Um, what you can do is create a plot function, which we don't have time to cover um, just in this workshop, um, but you can then apply the same plot to different data sets, which is great if you want to give different feedback to different candidates, for example, um, or just keep going um, with different data sets within a research project. If you have a report that you run every month and that you need to feed out um, plots, you can do this as well and get your annotations sorted. Um, so yeah, <laughs> great. That's a great comment in the chat. It's always lovely to see the surprise in your colleagues' faces when you make the changes as soon as they ask exactly. Is that thing, it makes you a bit of a local superhero. You know, you can get these plots done, you can get them all updated um, and everything looks great because you've spent the effort at a time when you had the time to spend the effort um, to make them look that good and it's not a last minute rush to get them sorted. So as I said, it's easier than you think and it makes a really big difference. Hopefully this has been a useful thing to, to take a quick look at. Um, and it can make you a bit of a local, uh, local hero um, and the surprise on your colleagues' faces is always worth it uh, when you've had time to, to do, um, yeah, just time to invest in making sure that the plotting function is always going to work with the data. Now you will end up getting surprises. You know, you can't always guess all the different permutations of where your bars might end up, but most of the time you're, it's a quick fix to, to get it to work if you've invested the time in getting your labels in the right place. So, I'm going to hand over to you again for a break and then after this is our last break okay so this is your last uh, time that i'm going to set you working in your own plots and after that i'm just going to show you some fun tricks that you can try uh, to apply in your own context so the task at this point is to try and add a text box or several to a plot that you're working on and try to add a bit of text hierarchy to that box um, and then see what happens if you just feed a sample of your data into the start of your plot code and see if everything moves in the way that, that it should move. And um, hopefully you've got enough uh, tips and tricks there. Go back to the slides and I'll, I'll paste that link to the slides again into the chat and um, if there are bits of markdown that you wanna have a look at. But here we go, 10 minutes. Um, and then after that, it will be um, the, the home straight uh, to, to the end of the presentation with enough time for some Q&A um, after that as well. So see you in 10 minutes.
Okay, we've got seven seconds to go <laughs> in your textbook creations. Um, I realized that was a quick, quick break after the previous one. Well, it came quickly after the previous one, but I just was keen to not overwhelm you with too much, uh, too many different possibilities as you set about creating box for your for your plots. And um, what I'm going to do in the rest of this talk now is to um, just show you different ways that you can use boxes and annotations. Um, and it's very much a, a kind of pick a mix at this point. OK, so take the things that you think you might want to use and have a look at them. The code is all in the in the slides. Uh, you can reuse that um, as much as you want to. And um, that's how I learned by seeing how other people did, did these kind of things. Uh, so go, go and reuse. And all of that. And we're going to be talking now about the, the final point, which is to highlight important patterns in your data. Um, sometimes there are some interesting data points in and of themselves that it's worth highlighting. And sometimes highlighting a particular point allows you to explain what the graph is showing in a way that just talking generally about all the points doesn't. Show. So for example, um, I remember a plot that was a time series, and it was really interesting. Um, and really helpful that the, the plot creator had added an arrow to say, this is a Monday. And then you could see whenever that spike came back again, okay, that's a Monday, that's what that spike means. And he just highlighted one of them. And um, rather than labeling all the Mondays as Mondays, you just had to highlight one data point and that did the job um, in explaining the story. So um, highlighting important patterns, there are lots of different ways that we can do it. Um, and people have done it in different ways um, throughout history as well. We'll, we'll touch on that uh, very briefly in a minute. So um, in order to look at how we highlight important patterns, we're going to go back to our penguins and see how they got on with their great penguin bake-off, who made the yummiest uh, penguin uh, banana loaf, um, and what type of banana was best, and how long did they leave them in the oven, and so on and so forth. We're going to look at means within the species, we're going to look at some trends, and we're going to highlight some key data points and taking these all in turns. And at this point in the presentation, you know how to get from this plot to this plot. Okay, you know how to get between these two plots. We've changed the colors, we've changed the fonts, and we've changed the theme elements to bring in fonts that we wanted um, and add a bit of text hierarchy there as well. So this, I'm not showing you anything here that you don't already know um, how to do from the materials that we've talked about. So we're going to build on this and add some labels um, into uh, plots. So uh, one thing that you could uh, think about doing is consider text boxes instead of a legend. Um, so if you label your data points directly on the plot, um, then sometimes that's a little bit easier to, to, to process what's going on. In order to do that, we're going to create a penguin summaries data frame. So what we're doing is we're taking the penguins data, we're grouping it by species, and then we're finding the mean bill length and bill depth, which are the two variables that we are completely misusing um, as baking duration and yumminess of the, the cake. OK, so that's, well, that's where that's coming from. Um, so we're going to first find these to find, basically, in taking the means, we're finding the, the, the central point of the, the data points that correspond to each species. OK, so we're taking within each species, what is the mean? Um, for the X and what's the mean for the Y so that we can put our boxes in the right place and um, on the plot. And then we're going to add a bit of commentary. So we're going to say, if the species is a deli, um, then we're going to write some blurb about what the Adeli penguins did. They were the ones that ended up with the, the green unripe bananas. And it turns out that that's not great in terms of yumminess in, in the way that we've plotted this data. Um, Gen 2, they ended up with the overripe bananas. And then True, remember that's our catch-all, and that's the chin strap. Um, penguins. So they had ripe bananas and took slightly longer cooking time. Um, let's just take a look what that looks like. So this is the data that we've ended up with from doing that quick manipulation. Okay, so we've taken the summary, we've then got the, the means here, which we're going to use as our x and our y coordinates. Um, and then we've got some commentary and we've got the species that is still in there. So we can take that data and add it into a text box. So the rest of the plot is all created using the, the penguins data. So that's the full data set. What you can do with the text box is you can give it different data, which you can do with other layers in a, in a GT plot as well. You can feed different data frames into different layers. So here we're feeding in the summary data. Um, and we are going to say, OK, for our label, 
because we already know that we've got x and y sorted um, because they're the same as the other variables that we're using in the rest of the plot. We just need to add in a label. So we're going to use a bit of markdown and we're going to paste team and then species. And you can see that turns into team Gentoo, team Chinstrap and team Fidelity. Um, and we're going to make that bold by using two asterisks either side. And then we're adding in a line break, which is what that little BR is. And then we're going to say, you know, the color of the text, because color for our dots is the color of the, the bananas, it's pulling that color into the text. So we need to override that for this kind of explanatory text that's underneath. Okay, so the color of Team Gentoo is brown because that's the color of the species, which the whole plot is coloring um, according to the, the type of banana. Um, this, the kind of sentences do not make any sense out of context, species and bananas and penguins. And it's all a bit mad, but if you've been following from the start, hopefully you don't think that I've, that I've totally lost the plot. Um, unintended. So we get the, the commentary goes in um, and we're going to feed our commentary, but we're going to override the color to make that our light text color. So again, adding a bit of text hierarchy um, within our labels. So that's what these look like. Um, from this point, we can do a little bit more formatting. So for this plot, we're using DM Sans as our basic font. Um, we're going to change the size of the text. You can change the, the width of the box. You can make the box slightly transparent so you can still guess at some of the dots that are behind it. Um, and we're going to remove a contour of the box as well with box color, box color equals NA. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing this if it's really important that your readers see all the individual points that are behind it. But what this does allow you to do is very quickly paint a picture. And if you're just looking at broad picture, then this is quite a useful trick that you're putting all the information in the plot in a way that, again, reduces the eye movement. Um, and that makes it really easy to identify which cluster of points corresponds to, to which species. And you're adding some extra story into it in, at the same time. So it's not just a direct label of what corresponds to what, you're also adding a little bit more as to the patterns that you found in your data. Um, although probably not to do with penguins, but you never know. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Another one that you can look at is Geom Text Pass. Uh, which doesn't work great in this plot, uh, but what it does is it adds a label um, within the line that corresponds to, to the data. And um, again, with this one, I tend to use uh, your text path and then set the stat to, to smooth so that you get the line that is uh, the equivalent of Geom smooth, um, but you can add a little label um, inside of that if you want to. Um, let's just check what I've done in terms of text. Yes, yeah, so I've just pasted team and then the species. Um, and because the color by default is the color of the species, again, it's automatically coloring the text and the lines uh, that we're using within Geom text path. To make that a little bit clearer, I'm adding a rectangle behind it um, that spans the, the plot. Um, it's a white rectangle and it's very transparent. This is a bit of a hack to make the transparency so low. Um, it's because of the way that we've built the plot and um, it's creating one of these for every data point. So that's why we've had to put the alpha so low. Um, if you were going to do this, uh, the proper way to do it would be to feed your data um, just into the geom points um, and rework a little bit. What we're doing. This is just to illustrate what geom text path is doing here. And um, hopefully you can see it well enough. Zoom isn't always the best for kind of fine detail. Um, but we've got the team Gen2 uh, printed on there and it follows the line. And it's just a nice way, again, of making it easy to see uh, what's going on. And you could add some narrative to that if you wanted to. You know, Generally, baking cakes for longer results in yummier cakes or something like that would be something that would apply uh, within all of these data points. And um, we can then do a bit of formatting. Again, you could change the font, you can make it bold, you can change where the label sits within the line, whether it's slightly elevated, whether it's right in the middle, um, and you can, with the, the vertical justification and then with the horizontal justification, you can put it towards the, the front or towards the end, end of the line. Again, just play around with these kind of things. And um, they might be more or less useful for your own context, but it's a useful trick to have if you do tend to show um, these kind of lines within your data. Um, and I should add, this isn't anything new. So these are, um, some of you might recognize um, Playfair's work um, from, you know, the, the father of data viz, as he's considered to be. I had the privilege of seeing 
uh, some of his work in the Edinburgh Uni Special Collections um, a few weeks ago. If you're ever in Edinburgh and fancy um, a really nerdy, exciting moment, um, book yourselves an appointment with the Special Collections folks. They were absolutely brilliant with us. Um, but what you can see here is he's got he's got it going. Yeah, he's got the the labels that move with the data. He's got colours that are intuitively you know in favour is green against is red. Um, we've got lines that go all the way through it that are consistently coloured. Um, yeah, annotations on the plot. You know, it's all trying to make it intuitive and reducing the eye movement. And it's just really quite fun when you see something like that. You think, oh yeah, that's Geom Text Bath. Um, obviously, it's not its own doing it, um, but uh, it's really fun that we get to reproduce these kind of effects in R um, because of all the packages that people are adding to the the GeoCot ecosystem. Um, the other option, if you want to use um, the, the text path and you're not able to see the data, um, uh, is to use a uh, text path with geom label path. Um, that creates a label behind it, which just makes the text stand out a little bit more. And again, you can do all the formatting on the text. And uh, Martina, you're asking who that was. That was William Playfair, um, who, uh, yeah, Raymond and I were just chatting about him actually in the chat. Um, about the, the work that he did, um, but we, it's very, very early data viz. He I think was, um, there was some architecture and also some cartography and a whole bunch of stuff that was going into informing the way that he would present data visually, um, but really, really fascinating um, to, to have a look at the, the stuff that he was doing. Those of us who were there in the special collections kind of all agreed that it seemed too mature um, to, uh, to be the first iteration of this kind of stuff. But um, yeah, it was just really fun to see how he went about it and also um, to discuss the ways in which he manipulated the axes. So you got to the X axis that had, you know, it was a timeline, but it was not consistent in its spacing. Um, and we had a good discussion about whether that was okay or not. <laughs> but we thought considering everything else that he'd added to our, our tools and tricks, um, we, should, we would let him get away with that. But yeah, it was, it was just really good fun. So anyway, so all that to say, Geom Textworth, Great package, um, it's not necessarily a new concept, but um, the package is really, really good for, for adding this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, pie charts as well, uh, I'll link to him. Um, so we've looked at the, the means and how uh, the mean species we're doing. Let's have a look now at how we would highlight specific data points. So how did our individual penguins get on? So at this point, we need to do a little bit of housekeeping in the data because we need to use the penguins raw data rather than the penguins data. And um, so don't worry too much about this. What we're doing is making sure that the, the variables in the penguins raw data line up with the variables that we're using for the penguins data, and um, just so that the, the plot reads in the right variables. And um, the names that are in the penguins raw data are quite different. So we just need to make sure that they're formatted in the same way. And once we've done that bit of tidy up, we then want to find our star baker, our runner up, and the lowest score in the bunch. Okay, so the star baker will be the one that has the maximum bill length, because we're using bill length as our measurement of yumminess. Um, and then the runner up is the one who comes second when we sort them um, in decreasing order. So that's the, the second best penguin in our bake off. And then we want to find the one who did, who got the worst score. So that would be the one who has the, the minimum value of the length. So we're finding our penguin highlights, the penguins that we want to keep. Um, and then there's a bit more house, uh, housekeeping that we need to do um, because the species names in the raw data are different from the species names in the penguins data. There's just a bit more detail in them. So all we're doing here is keeping the first chunk of the species name. Um, I love a bit of regular expression if I can get it the first time around. If I can't, then I hate it. Oh, <laughs> it's really good fun and quite satisfying when you do get it uh, blind on the first, first attempt. So we've got, um, yeah, this is just explaining what that, what that regex is doing or regex. Um, a bit of text manipulation again. We are going to add some commentary about our individual penguins and we're going to use the individual ID, what species they are, which island they're from, um, and add in some text. So we're going to find the star baker, who's the one who has the maximum bill length, and we're going to say our star baker is, and then we're going to read in that penguin's ID, um, and we're going to read in what species they are, which island they're from, and then say congratulations to them, because that feels like the right thing to do um, for our penguins. 
We're then going to find the runner up and similar story again. We're going to say what species they're from, which island they're from, uh, and their individual ID, and then a bit of extra commentary that we can add because we know uh, that both the ripe and the overripe bananas did all right in our Bake Off competition. And then true, this is going to be the, the runner up penguin, because that's the only one that's left in this highlight data set. Um, and we're going to say, flag their ID and say they didn't have a great baking day, and add a bit of commentary onto that. So let's just have a look um, at what that looks like. So this is what the data looks like that we're going to feed into the next set of boxes. So as I said, we've got the ID, we've got the species, we've got the island, and then we've got the commentary that we've created by combining these things with a bit of extra text that we wanted to add in. Um, this is the plot that we have. So we want to figure out where we want to put our labels. Um, so there's a bit of space over here that would suit quite nicely to highlight this top point here. And um, we've got a bit of space here that we can use to highlight this point here, who's our runner up. And then we've got a good amount of space over here that we can use to highlight this penguin that was the one with the lowest score. So we're going to add the coordinates of where we want these boxes to lie into the penguin's highlight data. Um, yeah, I just sorted them so that it was easier to remember which one was which, um, and then added the labels in like this. Um, that's probably slightly lazy of me. I should have done some more case when and said when the length was maximum, uh, the maximum length, then the X is this, etc. But I thought for the sake of getting through the, the workshop without everybody um, seeing too much redundancies within the slides, I would just take a bit of a shortcut here. So we're saying where the X and the Y coordinates are for the boxes that we want to add in. And then we're also programming in the alignment um, within the box of left to right. So where we want that box to sit compared to the point, uh, which is the same thing as we did earlier in our bar chart in terms of where we wanted the, uh, the box to sit, whether it was inside or outside of the end of the, of the bar. And same thing here again. So we're saying if the label um, is going to be yeah, if the X is going to be that way, then we want to align it this way. And if it's going to be that way, then we want to align it that way. Again, you can step through the code um, in your own time to, to revisit this. And then finally, we're going to add in some arrows. So we need to say, OK, we're going to start the arrow at the X and Y coordinates that we've provided um, just over here. And then we want the arrow to end uh, pointing towards the point that we're highlighting. And again, we're going to do a bit of conditional degree pokery to make sure that the arrow stops just short of the point, regardless of which direction it's coming from, so that we don't have an arrow that ends up going to the wrong side of the, of the point that we're trying to highlight. And this will make so much more sense when we look at what it looks like in the plot, trust me. So this is the plot as we have it. We've got the, the means and the, the bit of narrative that we had added there. And then we're going to add an extra text box in here, uh, which is coming from the penguin highlights data which we just created, um, which contains information about the star baker, the runner-up, and the penguin who did not do so well um, in the baking competition. Um, same as earlier, we can do some formatting. Uh, we can change the, the size of the text. We can remove the backgrounds. We can uh, make sure that there is no contour to the box. And then we're using these um, X, Y, and left to right to position the boxes. Um, with regards to the dots that they are pointing towards. Um, then we're going to add in the arrows, and we're going to use Geom Curve to add the arrows in. And again, we're using the Penguin Highlights data, um, and the arrows start at the coordinates of the box, and the end at the conditional points where we had left them earlier. Uh, which means that they should end just shy of the points that they're highlighting, which, if you look closely, is exactly what's happening, um, which is quite fun. So well done us for managing to do that. Um, again, there's a bunch of formatting that you, do, you can do for your arrows to make sure that they, you know, you don't want your arrow to be the main thing that people look at. Uh, so you want to make your arrow fade into the background a little bit, make it a little bit more transparent, uh, make it not too, too wide, um, and a little bit of a curve is quite useful. Um, yes, and then we want to make sure that we align the text inside the box. So keep your eyes on the dots and you can see that the text is ending up getting aligned so that it is aligned towards the direction that you want to be looking in. 
Um, again, it's just a simple trick, but it avoids you having too much trailing space there at the edge of your box if you do it nicely um, like that. So again, you might be asking why enough am I bother doing that? I could just annotate it in something else. Here is the case for doing it um, that you can create yourself a penguin plot function and then feed it new data and the labels will adjust um, to where they need to be. Now, remember we hard coded where those commentary boxes were about the highlighted penguins. Um, you could um, code those in such a way that those boxes would move around with the points as well. Um, I just thought I would keep things a little bit more simple um, so that we, we can keep track of what's going on. But as you see, this again makes the case for doing this kind of stuff in R, um, creating new plot functions in such a way that they update themselves when you feed them more data. Um, so there we go. There, there we have it. We've leveled up our plots. Uh, we've gone from plots that were perfectly functional and contained all the information that they needed to contain to plots that kind of draw you into the story a bit more um, that are going to be more memorable for the people that are, that are reading them. Um, we've looked at markdown tricks. We've looked at geom text tricks. We've looked at um, conditional alignments um, and have hopefully made the case uh, for A, thinking a little bit about a database design system for your project, and B, thinking about which bits of code you can package up and make um, so in such a way that they respond programmatically to the, the data that you're going to be feeding them. Um, but the possibilities are kind of endless. You know, I've given you here some tricks that I've enjoyed using um, and ones which I thought we could, we could cover in the space of the workshop. Uh, but there are so many other things that you can do, um, which is why I, I really recommend um, taking a look at the, the Tidy Tuesday challenge um, and seeing how people customize the plots that they're creating there and reusing bits of that that you think are, are useful. Um, okay, there's a comment here about customizable parameters, but the documentation for most of it is really bad. Yeah, I find the documentation is written by people who write documentation for people who read a lot of documentation. I spent ages when I first started learning R trying to figure out what on earth foo and bar were. Um, and why were they in the documentation everywhere? It turns out they're just placeholders for strings of text. Um, these kind of things, you kind of, the more documentation you read um, that is within the same field, the easier it gets. Um, I mentioned at the start that I'm trying to learn um, a different language and I'm finding it really hard to understand the documentation within that. So I think you do, you do get quicker understanding it um, the, more, the more you practice doing that, but that's not at all to diminish the efforts that you've already put in. Um, to understand it. And I think one of the things that, that I find difficult is the error messages that can be really quite hard to track back to, to what's gone on. Um, yeah, resources to explore the, the parameters. I would say, I, would, I find it easier to understand what the parameters do by looking at what someone's done and seeing the output of the code rather than trying to understand it just from the documentation. And um, so again, if you try and follow a few folks from within the Tidy Tuesday challenge and see what they did with their plots, um, you can, I, I found that really helpful in understanding how, um, yeah, just how the plot functions work and what you can manipulate um, and how to go about it. You know, all this trick of reading in different bits of data for different layers, and that's something that I got from there um, as well. So yeah, hopefully that will, that can unlock things a little bit um, if you're getting stuck. Um, you can also search GitHub um, for specific functions and um, for specific strings. And so you could have a look and see if you can find a repo in which that's being used and then you can see what the, out, uh, the outcome of that is um, as well. Yeah, so the, the other trick is to make things really ugly. You know, I, I tweeted about that the other day. I was creating a table function for a client um, and trying to add his own aesthetics into uh, an interactive table so that he could then create any reactive tables, tables that he wants to from any data that he wants and they will all look like they've come from from his consultancy um and i i just to try and get my head around it i made it really really ugly so i said you know i use the default colors of you know make this text red and make the background green and make the lines blue and you know just so that you can see really really obviously what's doing so i would say push things to um to extremes where you can um, and see in pushing things to extremes, it will show you what, what that function is doing. Can I restate the four guidelines that start with use color consistently? I can try. Uh, so use color consistently and add some text hierarchy to your plots. 
um, try to reduce eye movement by putting um, text at a point where it makes sense to look. And the fourth one that we've looked at there is um, highlight important patterns, uh, which will help you um, make sense of the data, help other people make sense of the data really quickly. Yes, I managed to remember what the four points of my, of my workshop were. I'm quite chuffed with that. Um, great, so I'm glad, I'm glad if people have found this useful and um, then that's really great to hear. Thank you for popping that in the chat. But yeah, so the possibilities are endless and I just, you know, play around. These are the plots that I made using the building blocks that we've talked about here. Um, using um, Lego and um, using um, GG text and using uh, scale, um, scale color identity uh, to look into the, the different Lego colors that were there for that one. Uh, what else have I done? This is some kind of explaining models and looking at the light through the year. You can look at different uh, coordinates that you can use. That's using the, the polar coordinates for this, this plot here. Um, which again, kind of find out by seeing what other people are doing. And if you really want to go silly, you know, you can use emojis and you can animate things as well, um, which is quite a fun trick and not always super useful, but, you know, why not? I mean, if you think it helps your data try and answer so you have a sense of humour, then it's worth doing these things. So yeah, we've made it um, to, uh, to the end of the materials that I had. Well done, everyone, for, for sticking with it. Um, hopefully that's given you some, some useful tips and tricks um, that you can use in creating your own plots. Um, I said it earlier and I'll, I'll reiterate it again, more than happy to interact um, you know, reach out if you have some, any questions, if you get stuck on another thing, um, more than happy to, to try and troubleshoot that. So get in touch um, it'd be great to hear from you if you've got um, feedback. Oh, thanks, some really nice feedback in the, in the chat there, that's really lovely to read, thank you. Um, and yeah, stay in touch. Uh, I'm going to hang around in here for the rest of the chat, uh, for the rest of the session. Uh, we, we finished a little bit early, which gives you a bit of a break before the next workshop, but I felt like bombarding you with any more information would be uh, just, just too much. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to hang out here. Feel free to, to hang out and see the, the questions that come up, um, or feel free to uh, yeah, just head off and start uh, coding your own, your own plots. Uh, but thank you so much for, for all your questions and for your participation. Um, it's been it's been a really enjoyable workshop and thank you to, to Martina as well for um, keeping me right, just giving me that safety net that I would make sure that I saw um, saw the questions uh, that, that were coming in there. So yeah, you're free to go. Um, I'm going to hang around. Um, so yeah, let me know if you have any more questions. Can you awkward silence? <laughs> Oh, I was going to pop a link to uh, there's already a tidy Tuesday based somewhere. Um, oh, your next talk, nice. Yeah, there's a link to the next talk. So, if people wanted to find out more about um, that's the database design system that I was talking about, um, yeah, you can catch it there. Probably. Yeah, I will pop you the link on my website. I just couldn't get the video to work uh, today, but I'll, I'll I'll look at that tomorrow. Oh, Nathan, thanks. That's a good point about case when and the, the dot default arguments. Um, yes, I may be using a slightly older version of case when. Um, I think they did change the way that defaults were, were handled, so that's helpful to, to point out. Thank you. Another case for reading the, the up-to-date documentation. Yeah, Martina, I'm with you. I keep the tree. I, I, I find the tree one really helpful. Um, but then the updated case when deals better with NAs. So previously I had to revert back to if else, if I wanted to deal with, to have NAs as a possible outcome of the, the case oh. when permutations. Yeah. So you, can, it, you, you can use NAs, but you have to choose the type of NA. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, which is, which is uh, I think, an advantage rather than jumping back between um, case when and if else in times when yeah. you need it. It took me time to understand why it was true for the last uh, option, but then yeah. it's, yeah, 
it's very logical, so I really like it now. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's worth that's worth having. Great. Uh, so, Yukta, I think you uh, typed your question to me directly instead of uh, to everyone or to Kara. So maybe uh, I can read it for you. Question, Kara, from Sam Yukta. Or are you here and you ask it yourself? It's a question about, uh, could I ask about good data transformation practices? to make plotting easier, or is this beyond the scope of this session? I found that, that I spent most time on this while making my plots. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, good data transformation is, is really hard. I think um, there's actually a workshop that's happening at the same time as this, and um, Crystal Lewis is part of that, and she, she to me, is, is um, yeah, I've worked with her on a few projects, and her insight into how to do this well is just brilliant. So if you have a chance to, to catch the, the replay of that, I recommend it. Um, I think, yeah, when you're transforming stuff into your plots, I would say try to leave, try to do as little transformation as you can, um, because you don't want to be changing your data, uh, but you can you can change what comes out the, the other side of the pipe. Um, so yeah, it's worth making sure that in your transformations, you're not doing funny things like getting the factors mixed up and all that. I mean, you'll be, you'll be aware of that as well. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, really, it depends on the type of data that you're working with. Um, I find it easier to create, for example, to create summary data frames and then feed those in rather than use the, the stat equals, whatever it would be, uh, you know, count or mean or something. Um, I find it more intuitive. I think the, the key really is that you have good visibility on what the transformations are, and um, so that you're you're aware of what you're doing, um, and you can uh, catch errors and things that are not going quite right. Um, you, I would recommend using things like test that to make sure that you've got um, that you're sure the transformations are doing what they should be doing. Um, but that's it gets harder and harder to do as your data gets larger and larger. So definitely go and watch um, the the workshop. That's happening in parallel to this one about cleaning data uh, because it will be it will be much more informative than, than any answer that I could give uh, that I could give there. Um, there was also a question from uh, Matthew about um, about my background. I covered it very quickly at the start, but um, so you didn't miss much. Um, mostly to do with uh, yeah. So I I grew up um, with a fascination for patterns in music and in language. I um, had the privilege of doing a PhD in psychology to see something to do with how we process patterns and how we process things that we're not expecting to see in patterns in music and language. Um, from there, in psychology, you do a lot of statistics. And so I um, went from there to a job um, in the postgraduate medical assessment world, analyzing exam data, um, and decided, well, discovered uh, that I had a knack that I, that I could develop for concisely explaining complex things to busy audiences. Um, you know, surgeons um, are, are great and don't have that much time uh, sometimes to spend on these things. And it's really, really good to be able to feed them in the information in a way that they understand it quickly. Um, and I found visualization to be a really, really great shortcut in that, um, in that they could see the graph and they could remember it. Um, and that, that made the explanation um, so much easier for what was going on in the data. Um, and then it was a series of uh, circumstances of going on maternity leave and wanting to keep my hand in and discovering the Tidy Tuesday people and um, getting involved there and um, just growing and growing in my skills. Um, as I was just really excited to see what could be done uh, with R for data visualization. Um, and then, yeah, went from there to, to launching a, a consultancy um, and have really enjoyed the, the projects that I've been working on and just being able to bring these plotting solutions to, to people um, who work in, in a whole host of different fields. Um, but the main thing for me is I get to make other people's work look good. You know, I get to, I get to um, allow other people to shine um, with the expertise and the, get the reward that they, that they deserve for the, the hard work that they've put in. Um, and that, that to me is, is really rewarding. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Matthew.
Thank you. Okay, I think people are gradually, gradually disappearing. <laughs> if you're hanging in here and you have a question, um, let me know what it is. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, if there are no more questions, I suggest we call it a day. Shout now if you if you want if you have something else you want to ask, or just get in touch um, in any of the channels that I've popped up on the screen there. Um, yeah, it's been um, it's been lovely sharing this workshop with you guys, and thank you so much for for all your contributions and your feedback in the chat. Um, it's been great, and I, I hope to see you around um, in the future and uh, in this conference as well. So enjoy the rest of your day and uh, we will see you soon. Bye everyone. And thanks again, Martina. <laughs>